you for watching this week's sermon. We hope you're encouraged and blessed by it. If you want to know more about our church, please visit our website at southportchurchonline.com. I hope this week is a blessed week for you, and if we have not met you, we would love to. Please visit our church um, at either our 9 o'clock or our 1030 service on Sunday. God bless. Out of Revelations chapter 19, verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. The fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And I saw standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped with blood. And his name is the word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time of worship. God Almighty, we adore you and seek to glorify you this morning, this day. God, I pray over this time of reading your word and of this sermon, God, may these be words and thoughts that build up your church, that encourage the saints. God, as we continue to wrap up this sermon series, may we be encouraged, may we be invited, and may we be empowered to live the life of faithful and true followers of you, Jesus. We love you, God, and we pray all this in your heavenly name. Amen. Church, I wanted to set ourselves up at the beginning this morning of, with worship and praise and the adoration of our God. For the King of kings and the Lord of Lord reigns evermore. And I seek to ring that truth into our worlds this morning, regardless where some of us may be on the edge of something. We may be on the edge of some of us despair. Some of us may be on the edge of confusion maybe on the edge of frustration, maybe on the edge of wrath. Some of us may be on the edge of depression and dipping down into it. Some of us may be on the edge of just being melancholy, or some of us may be on the edge of just gloating with pride. And it seems that no matter where we are, I would say that four hallelujahs pulls us from that edge. And it brings us into a place where the act of worship to God creates in us a humbleness and an adoration of the presence of the glory of the Father. And that's where I desire for us to set our minds and our hearts and our focus this day as we complete the series on the book of Revelation. A brief survey of that book for this last month, and I pray that you've been encouraged and empowered as we have looked at the dragon in the sea this month. And our scripture this morning depicts 
the sounds of worship like a roaring, rushing water and loud peals of thunder. Can you remember ever hearing that in your life? That is the sound of the saints in, on earth and in heaven shouting hallelujah. And if we only could be invited into that place of adoration more and more in our day-to-day -day lives. And we know that there are people in this world that exist with practices, spiritual practices, that help provide moments of opportunity for them. People who perhaps pr practice a daily office of prayer or meditation or fasting. They put in their hearts and in their days disciplines to help them to practice this adoration to God each and every day. It's a great reminder and encouragement to us who probably live in, with so much busyness that we're just getting through sometimes. But I want us to be reminded this morning that we may come from different streams of how we practice this life of faith. Maybe you are someone who is more about meditation on the Word of God and seeking to be in a quiet place to meditate. Or maybe you're more of a naturalist like me and, and you see God working in nature. And when you go into the woods or on hikes or by a river or a stream, in nature you see God communicate His goodness and His promise to you. And there's many other ways to demonstrate and to learn about how to engage with God. And we see these many streams of spiritual life flow together and form into this rushing water of praise. And I would encourage you that whatever stream that God kind of created you to travel down to learn how to engage with him in this life, encourage you to have that vision of the future that we read here in chapter 19. To envision that this is our future of what is to come. And the truth is, is that we all have been called to steward this truth in our lives, no matter where we are, no matter the circumstance. And the thing is, is because we've all been called to be leaders in our own worlds. You are a leader of the gospel because you've been entrusted by the gospel. And when the thing about leaders is that when they have a vision of the future, that's when they start to see change in their life. They allow that future to drive their choices. And if you have a good view of chapter 19, of the return of Jesus Christ, then that's going to change your present view and outlook. And that's my hope for you this morning, that you continue, no matter your context, no matter your circumstance, no matter what you're on the edge of or what you're celebrating, that you remain fixed with your eyes on Christ, anticipating his coming. And we will all one day be in the multitude with all the saints who praise God at that return. And we will be in the presence of each other. And we will be like guests at the wedding, anxious and excited, anticipating the groom to be united with his bride. And in this case, the church united with Jesus in harmony and with our redeemed pur purity a purity of heart that we are called to possess by our acts of faith and faithfulness so that we rout out any forms of corruption or hate or twisting of the truth that tries to trip us up or others from the promised abundant life that Jesus seeks to give us. And I got to say, in recent scrolls of Netflix and media headlines, I made a comment to Jess the other night, that there seems to be this recent surge of interest and glorification and focus on acts of violence and murder amongst us. We've really tried to tame it and dole it down, I think, to make it entertainment for us. Stories and documentaries and accounts and newsreels, all in this interest of seeing the creation of God, you and I, declaring authority over life itself and taking it from one another. We are just so saturated with this that the preciousness of life itself seems to lose its worth for our fascina fascination and entertainment at times. And evenings turn into late night binges of looking and learning and watching tales and viewing experiences and acts that we know that we would never be a part of ourselves. And our challenge as God's people, as the bride of Christ, is to realize 
that the level of spiritual maturity that we are called to grow into is that it's not enough to, to just say, thou shall not murder, but more and more thou shall not leave any form of sin and death to be more palatable than others so that they don't grab our attention and pull us and entice us away from this work of being God's people so that we don't even ponder and wonder what if that was us. And when we read in verse 8, the fine linen to be adorned on the bride of Christ that is given bright and clean. Bright, fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. These linen are the adoration or the adornments of our works as God's people in purity, with dignity. That is what we are to clothe ourselves in as God's people. Nothing less. And we look at that opportunity. We must ask ourselves, where are there places in our lives that isn't filled with the anticipation for Christ to return? While we reliably keep carrying out our deeds of faith, knowing that we are called to be adorned with this integrity, with this special place, with God dwelling in us because we said yes to the Holy Spirit. And where is it, church, that we instead are soiling the opportunity on our end of the union with Christ because we aren't faithful and true? In the end where we are faithful and responsible to be pure and to do good works because we know the value of life. We know the value of Christ giving us new life. And this, I'm not talking about perfectionism. God knows we can't accomplish the standards he set on our own. <laughs> and that's where grace comes in. So that is why the church needs people like you and I to display our understanding of the precious gift of salvation and the precious gift of grace that we've received from God, that we've received from others who have forgiven us, who love us, who tend to our helps and our needs and, and steward us further to grow in Christ-likeness. Because the thing is, is that we're then called to distribute it and give it to others instead of guilt trips of religious perfection that so many are turning themselves away from. I can't, I can't complete that, so I'm out. And I wonder, we read here, if you look, if you survey on your smart tablet or your Bible or whatever you have in front of you, if you look at chapter 19, you can look back and you can see the hallelujahs, right? In the different sections of that chapter. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And I said this is Bob's sermon this morning. And this act of praising hallelujah isn't saved for holidays or moments of near-death experiences. It's for everyday life. And I was thinking about that when I have said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It reminded me of a time I was trying to leave Mexico. That's always a good way to start a story, right? Where is he going? <laughs> but it was a mission trip, and I was leading a bunch of high school students. We built a couple houses on a, a, a week that just rained, period, constantly. And I drove a 24-passenger bus and we were in Tijuana, about to get into the border crossing line, and suddenly someone goes, where's Timmy? 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 Where's Timmy? So we had vans behind us, and I pulled off to the side. Oh, we got to find where Timmy is. Okay. And I was going to get out, and I got out of the passenger bus, and as I stood out, I looked left first, instead of looking that way, and this semi with his trailer was coming right at me. And all I could do is do this so that it passed right by me. Good thing I'm a small guy, you know, so I'm a big guy. So <clears throat> you're very kind. You didn't laugh at that. That's very nice of you. But it was one of those moments where it was so close. If I had just kind of hung out there, I would have been taken out. But what I didn't realize until I got back into the bus, all my students saw was Mike could get out of the seat and the semi come by right by them and they didn't know where I was. And they all panicked. They all thought I got taken out. But then we found Timmy in the bus, in the van behind us. Thanks a lot, Timmy. Love ya. But that was a moment where I said, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
And I wonder how often we recognize the faithfulness of Christ. What I believe is the Spirit of God that pulled my head that way to look, to go, whoa. And I wonder how many experiences you have had where you, you know it was the Spirit of God being faithful to you to preserve your life, your well-being. And so we have to recognize Christ's faithfulness and how often we see his true acts for us. We proclaim them. And if we really consider it, if we really got down to the nitty gritty, we could have so much to give God adoration for every breath. Because that is a precious gift of his faithfulness to us. Every breath is a gift. Every breath is an opportunity to say to him back, hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you. And what you need to know today is that these verses detail to us that one day, Jesus will be recognized by the whole world as the one called faithful and true, the Son of God. The whole world. Right now, the whole world doesn't recognize him as that. They have a lot of titles and labels and ideas, but hopefully for us, he is the one who is faithful and true, the Son of God. Faithful and true is the title of my sermon this morning. Faithful and true. And I wonder, are these words that roll off your tongue easily when you consider who Jesus is? Faithful and true. Or are we in the process of coming into agreement with that about calling him these things? Is there an area of your life you're like, well, I'm a little more in control there. And or are we able to say whatever he calls upon us, I trust him because he's faithful and true. And faithful and true, these seem to be qualities that are in pretty short supply in this world that we live in. And we read them, we should understand what Christ is called upon because he is faithful to be trusted and true, reliable. Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is reliable. And I wonder how many times in our lives we've been called upon to be trusted, to be reliable. I don't know what your, what your batting average is. It's probably not a 1,000, right? It's probably been moments where you couldn't, couldn't accomplish the task. But we see that in friendships that maybe start on the playground or those today that are presently places that receive our hurt, our fears, our needs, or our successes and what we celebrate, we need places where we have the security to be trusted and to be reliable. In giving vows to your spouse, if you're married, the promises are to God and to the other person at the altar are in effect saying, I can be trusted, God and person. I am reliable. You're giving those vows as that promise, as that covenant. It's not contractual. It's not saying, you better be trustworthy, you better be reliable, or it's over. No, no, no. You are proclaiming, I am, because we're trusting that he is. And in a marriage, we need both. We need God to guide us, and we need each other to continue to say over and over again, I can be trusted. I am reliable. Because on a good day, the only person that you're able to control is yourself. So why we need to know this about Jesus will be recognized by the whole world as the Word of God and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it's because we know the truth that there is no other source of authority in the world that is more trustworthy and more reliable than the Lord God Almighty. We need to know this. We need to practice this. We need to demonstrate that. It comes into when God calls us to sacrifice and to trust him, to obey, withhold, deny, close that door, don't call up that X. Whatever it is, we have to trust him. He is more reliable and more trustworthy. And we all come to this question in our lives, who is Jesus? I've said this a few times. When I was 19 and I came to faith, I got this little pamphlet, who is Jesus? He was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And we will know how we answer that question by where we end up standing when verse 19 comes to reality. First, we either will be in anticipation as a bride before our union and redemption with our Lord, or we will know that as he executes his righteous judgment, 
of the earth, whether we deny the invitation to the wedding. And when we read that Christ with eyes blazing fire, that might trip us up and be like, what? But what this is symbolizing is that we read that as Christ comes in, he comes in with perfect knowledge of the whole earth. He comes in with perfect knowledge because he knows all and sees all. Christ is able to pe penetrate through all our pretenses. And I don't know what pretenses you put out there in your life, what fronts you have, what guards you keep, what narratives you ride. Jesus sees through all of it. He knows you. He loves you. And he wants his love to penetrate your heart so deeply that nothing else is more reliable and true than him. And so we see, and he sees, the places where we have traveled to distant lands in search of our own kingdoms or maybe our own pride and rebellion. And he sees today where we're taking the opportunity to declare him in our lives that he is to be trusted and we rely on his lordship. When was the last time you had to rely on the lordship of Christ in your life? It's a good question to ask because sometimes it helps you to go, maybe I've been too independent. Maybe I haven't stopped and go, I have a puppy at the home right now. You, if you come to the picnic, you get to meet my puppy. Hey, there's more incentive there, okay? But my puppy right now, I put him on my back. He goes, yep, you're master, right? And sometimes we have to get on our backs to go, Jesus, <laughs> I need your help. And sometimes we act too independent and get ourselves in, in trouble. And so we recognize that Jesus rides in from heaven. And this set of verses is the clearest view we get of the second coming in the New Testament, of what it will look like, be like, what's going to take shape. This is a clear view of what we have. And we, we see that his name is inscribed on his thigh. And this is what John is depicting. It's very much like the statues of the day, like in the city of Ephesus. There was a statue of the emperor of Rome riding a horse, and on his thigh was inscribed his name. So John, what he's basically saying is that Jesus is above all other authority in the world. You better recognize, right? And so Jesus, we see at this moment, all the world will behold his name and all the world will behold his justice. And he comes in with an iron scepter and we read that and we might go, that sounds really militant, but we also translate the Greek. That word also means shepherd. And so we trust the shepherd that Christ will rule. And he comes with the sword, the sword or the word of God to not warfare, but to evangelize, to not slaughter, but to convert the hearts of men and women in the world of all nations to behold and receive the gift of Christ as Lord of lords and King of kings. And this is what is so undeniable about the work of Christ as the author of Hebrews depicts in chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God, hang on, almost there, click, 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 slide, 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 there we go, thank you, the, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I am so thankful that that's what the word of God does. Because sometimes we get too independent and we get lies wrapped up in truth. And so we ask, why, do, why does church, why do, why do Christians want you to be in the Word all the time? Why do they always want you to read the Word of God? So it does this. So that the lies that you have wrapped up and going around in your life, the Word of God can divide. That's from the enemy. This is the truth. This is where you walk. And so that's why we got to be in it. Thankful for the Word of God. Because, yeah, it may convict. That's okay. It may inspire. I hope so. But I hope it paints a picture that we are to be faithful and true to our Lord. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is faithful to come into your life over and over again. And is reliable to separate the lies of the enemy. And help you to see maybe where you're walking out of joint to help heal and bind and nurture and foster new growth and new life 
so that the attitude of the heart can be drawn into a place of fellowship with the Father, instruction of the, by the Spirit, and to follow the Son. I like that idea, to have that fellowship, that relationship with God, to be instructed by the Spirit to look left and to right, to know when buses and trucks are going to hit you, right? Or to follow and model after the Son of God so you know how to be fruitful in this life. And I don't know, you might be discouraged today. Discouraged that even though you know Christ, you may have followed him for so many years or have maybe half followed him or partially followed him here and there. And you may feel some shame because you might get tripped up in that whole perfectionist idea and, and, and guilt trip of religion. I don't want you to be there. I want you to be encouraged today. And John encourages us, because he didn't have to write this. He didn't have to put this part in his uh, uh, account with the angel. And you may consider the apostle John to have some upper echelon of authority in this special place in heaven. Well, I think he is, but he's not really that much different than us in some ways. Because even though he saw the awesome sights of heaven and the principalities of darkness and of light, he was able to demonstrate He's very much like us. And he says this in verse 10. Let's look at verse 10. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he, the angel, said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And what we see in John is that John has misdirected his praise. He misdirected his worship, not to God, but for a moment to an angel who is like ourselves, servants of God. And so what we see in John in this brief moment is that we see ourselves, that we who were created to worship something, that's what we are, we were created to worship God, and so we don't put God at the front, we put something else there. So a lot of people put themselves there, right? And so we see here, is that we can identify ourselves with the apostle. He is a man of flesh and blood like you and I. And yet he was directed to put his attention and praise to the Father. And that's exactly the opportunity that we get to do. We get to, in humbleness, be directed by the boldness of each other. When we need to be willing to speak into one another's lives, to not idolize a lesser focus of life than Jesus. Don't chase the dollar. Don't chase an endless set of broken bonds with sleeping after partner after partner. Don't chase the hiatus of feelings and emotions into alcohol or drugs. Don't, don't do these things. Don't worship these other things. Don't do that. Worship God. Rejoice that our action is to do this for each other and called to be having the same attributes of Christ, to be faithful and true, not only to God, but to one another. Now, before you go around and start policing each other, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I saw you do that, I shouldn't do that. I gotta say this, you are only able to speak these words of encouragement, instruction, protection, if you first possess the love of God for your brothers and sisters. If you don't hold that, do us a favor, hold your tongue. But if you can come from a place of love and humbleness, then speak. Speak with love. Because I think there are many who are fixers. They go around and they got personal projects. They try to clean up other people's mirrors. Let me help you, let me clean that up for you because here's what you're doing wrong, right? I'm gonna I'm going to get you right. They start cleaning up the mirrors of others so they can see some reflection, but they come home and they see their own mirrors cracked, broken, or full of smudges, and they do nothing about it. So they redirect, and they don't focus on the authority. They don't allow Jesus to be faithful and true enough to reveal what's going on in the brokenness of their own hearts. And so they project it to someone else. I can't fix me, so I'm going to fix you but I'm not going to go home and deal with that because it's too painful. Well, that's the challenge, right? We want the testimony to say, I didn't know how to handle this, but, but Jesus did it because I submitted myself to him. 
He became the most, the largest, the most potent authority in my life because no one is as faithful and true as Jesus in my life. And so what I see and have seen is that when people are too afraid to say I'm broken like the rest of us, or they're too afraid to say I need help, or they're too afraid to humble themselves before God, they live in this place of isolation from God. And really with others, because they put up fronts, right? And we don't know them. We want to know them. And so sometimes we see that these are grounds of places where wounds fester and they, and they, and they turn into places where servanthood turns into, into fruitless work. Or compassion moves from compassion to just empty empathy. Oh, I'm sorry, but I got my own problems, right? Servanthood can turn into manipulation of keeping people indebted because your acts of charity bind them, right? Well, now I feel indebted to you. You know, no. Serve one another without condition. You don't need to be paid back, right? You don't need, it doesn't need to be given back. No, I do this out of obedience to him. And we must always strive to hold on to the testimony, to rejoice of all the days before your life because we have such an opportunity to share in this victory with one another. In the anticipation of the coming of the groom, of Jesus coming back and coming now into our lives as the Spirit manifests newness and fruitfulness as we remain connected to the Father. And we read further in Revelation, we see, we anticipate not only the Christ coming, but the chaining of the dragon of Satan and the beast and cast it into the lake of fire. And not only that, we are so excited that we cannot wait for the new heaven and the new earth to be created. Right there we see, behold, I am making all things new, as that says. That's the words of Yahweh. We are going to see that. We want to anticipate that in our lives. The redemptive work of God, restoring this good earth and bringing us to our heavenly home, where we too receive a crown, says the Bible, where we too will receive a reward, and that there is reliability of that truth here on earth. And imagine if today, you are reminded of not only God's faithfulness and his true work in your life, but you are empowered to be faithful maybe again, to be reliable all the more, maybe for the first time, or get back in the game, right? We don't want you sidelined. We want you in the game of faith. We want, what would it look like in your world? in your relationships, in your marriages, in, with your kids, with your grandkids? What if today you decided that you will be known as that faithful follower of Jesus that is faithful and true to others? Do you want to be known for that? Do you want to be identified with the gospel message? No matter the circumstance, no matter what you're on the edge of. And if you're on the edge, again, I encourage you, if you're on the edge of something, you got to start praising God because he's going to pull you back to the center. He's going to pull you back from the edge. And we see that over and over again. And so what if we decided today that you're going to continue to build that testimony that you know Jesus is faithful and true? What will it do to this place? What will it do to your street? What will it do to West Sacramento? What will it do to the churches and the partners that we have around the world? What will it do? if we continue to demonstrate that we are faithful and true back to God and to one another. That's the church I want to be. That's who I want to be amongst. And I pray you do too. In this new chapter on the 16th, where we become a combined service here, that's the hope, that we are faithful and true to the gospel first, and in that to one another, in that to evangelism, to discipleship, to build up our young, our youth, our adults grow, our college students feel at home, and we continue to serve the community that we have been placed in. We are strategically placed because God set us up. So don't, let don't get, let's not get set up for the enemy. Let's get set up for God's purposes, right? May we be a church that is faithful and true. So what do we got to do? We got to know how to pray. And that's what our next series is going to be about. Starting next week, we're going to look at the book of Psalms. 
The prayer of Psalms, they're all about orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. I don't know. You're probably in one of those phases in life right now. You feel orientated. Hey, everything's fine. Maybe you feel disorientated. What is happening? Or then you're like, God, reestablish me where you're in reorientation. So I invite you for the next six weeks to learn how to pray through the, through the book of Psalms. And that's my hope. Because I don't know, do you have any challenges communicating with God? I do sometimes, right? Let's, let's learn how to speak. Let's learn how to pray. And let's be confident that God hears us as we remain faithful and true to God. I'm going to invite the worship team back up as we close our service this morning. I invite you to join us for the, the church picnic. Go grab some food. Let's go have some fellowship. Let's be out in this beautiful day together. Let's get to know each other more. You can pet my puppy, okay? It's a great little little husky dog, okay? Poor thing. It's going to be huskies with summer. But let's pray this morning as we go out this morning. Jesus, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the testimony of John, for what you showed him, God. He showed that you, Jesus, will return victorious, that you speak the truth of the word of God, the word that gives life, that gives power, that redeems us, that restores us, that pulls us from the edge of any despair, any fear. God, may we be pulled into that place of harmony with you and harmony with each other. God, may we continue to find ourselves faithful and true to you in some area of our lives that maybe has been out of step. And God, may we not live in shame because shame does not come from you, God. May we seek to be faithful and true to your redemptive work in our hearts and in this place. God, we thank you for your goodness. And we anticipate, God, you coming back. And may that motivate us to go share the good news. May we share those who are lost and in despair, who have no hope, who have no hallelujahs, to pull them back to joy. Muse us, God. Empower us. Maybe it's within our own home. Maybe it's on our street. Maybe it's in our workplace. Maybe it's that random of opportunity. May we be ready to be faithful and true to you to share the good news and the love of the gospel. We love you, God, and as we close out, we declare that you are our living hope, Jesus. Hallelujah to you, God Almighty. In your name we pray, amen.